prepared mind. Louis Pasteur talked about the prepared mind. It's the key to scientific discovery. The prepared mind also has chance, as you mentioned. The prepared mind is a person or a thinker who's out there, has content, and also has, takes the opportunity, Louis Pasteur said, and with that, he makes some terrific discoveries. Let me take you back a second. For me, Dr. Brooke Blumberg, one of my heroes, had a prepared mind. Dr. Blumberg, I had a chance to go with to, to Taiwan. As we walked through Taiwan, Dr. Blumberg looked around and he said, Taiwan used to have 18% of the country infected by hepatitis B. And Dr. Blumberg, a little background, Dr. Blumberg, he said, in order to think about what he's going to tell me about, you have to understand who he is. He'd gone to medical school, Harvard Medical School. I've gone to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. He said, after medical school, he trained to be a hematologist and psychologist. After medical school, I trained to be a hematologist and psychologist at the University of Chicago. Dr. Blumberg then said he went to Oxford and got his PhD and completed what he thought would be what he needed to be to be a prepared mind. I also got my PhD. My PhD is from Ann Corbett in Santa Monica. So I found that I talked to Dr. Blumberg, sitting next to him, was thinking about it, what he was going to tell me. I was thinking about how much I could learn and think about a prepared mind. Dr. Blumberg pointed out in Taiwan, 18% of the Taiwan population was hepatitis B infected. And the number caused, one cause of cancer in Taiwan, much of Asia and Africa, was hepatitis B infection. But Dr. Blumberg also said that he was curious, much like curiosity has, has affected most of the people today. Dr. Blumberg thought about things, and he discovered hepatitis B virus. Not only did he discover the hepatitis B virus, which is when he was in Australia, and noted that Aborigines seemed to have jaundice. And then he thought about it longer and longer, realized they had leukemia and they had received blood transfusions. And the blood must have, trans must have been transmitted with a virus. And it must be the hepatitis B virus. And Dr. Blumberg did discover the hepatitis B virus. But he said he couldn't just stop there. There's no way to just stop with scientific discovery. Dr. Blumberg, Barry Blumberg, made the hepatitis B vaccine. And he vaccinated all of Taiwan. And the hepatitis B rate in Taiwan went from 18% down to half a percent over 10 years. And this same kind of change was seen throughout Asia and Africa. And the number one savings of lives today for cancer people is not cigarette smoking, is Dr. Blumberg's discovery of the hepatitis B virus, which he won the Nobel Prize for in 1976 and which he discovered that the hepatitis B vaccination program and vaccinated most of, many of us in the audience have been hepatitis B vaccinated. Dr. Blumberg did all that. Now, the prepared mind was something he said to me also. He said, if you really want to read about my work more, and he says his autobiography, you can look at the paper that Charlie Bennett and I wrote about the Taiwan population. So I've always found a sense of love and the fact that I was part of his autobiography. But he did tell me in 1975, he got a very nice phone call. And it says, Dr. Blumberg, congratulations, you won the Nobel Prize. And he said he was so excited and had his friends come over to Champagne. And the next day in the New York Times, the paper comes out and there's no Nobel Prize. It was a false alarm. One year later, the phone rang again. Dr. Blumberg, you won the Nobel Prize. He said, fool me once, not this time. All the friends did not come over. The prize was awarded to Dr. Blumberg, and then he had the party. <laughs> so Dr. Blumberg, to me, was very much my hero in terms of being prepared and having a prepared mind to understand that. Some of my work that we talked about real quickly was related to, to the blood products as well. And it was an amazing time for me in about 2000, 2001, when as I looked at some data, I realized that for a small but real number of people who took erythropoietin, a drug, and got an antibody to it, and this antibody made the drug not effective. But the thing that was so weird about this sort of crazy identification of the problem we had was it only occurred in five countries, England, France, Spain, Canada, and Asia. 
And it turned out, as we thought about it longer and longer, that it seemed so weird, but it, it was related to bad tongue disease. This was curious. And what we understood and we thought and connected the dots was that mad cow disease in 1998 was a big problem worldwide, but primarily in those countries that it's named. And the reason why mad cow disease became a problem is the cows were infected, and albumin was a mediator of the infection and related to a virus that the cows would have. And these cows would develop dementia and die. And we should not eat meat from England during the period of time. But it turned out the blood product was made with the same albumin in those countries, not other countries. And when transmitted, it could cause a kind of an antibody mediated effect. But we also proposed that they put a Teflon stopper on the valve, that there would no longer be the, the reaction that would lead to the antibody formation. Added a small Teflon stopper, all the drug became safe. And the whole world no longer had that side effect. So for me to go back, to think back, I think back about my medical school training at the University of Chicago. Somebody like Dr. Blumberg, Janet Rowling, another one of my heroes, nine years old, she just died two years ago. But Janet Rowling, she discovered the 923 translocation for chronic leukemia. Let me say that a little bit in plain. In the days that Janet Rowling was looking in genetics of cancer, she used to cut up the chromosomes into small squares because we did not have technology. And she'd have these small squares and she'd look visually at the chromosomes for these small squares. And what she decided to do one day at her house was to cut the 23 chromosomes up and put it on the dining room table. And she said, there must be something in these chromosomes that will tell me something that I should know. She could not figure it out. But thankfully, she had two small children, one age six and one age 10. And she said to the children, come into the dining room and you better help me here. The six-year-old ran over to chromosome nine and looked at the chromosome and says, Mommy, I think there's some part of that chromosome missing here. The 10-year-old went over to chromosome 23 and said, Mom, I think there's some extra pieces here. And the two children, age 6 and age 10, had discovered the 923 translocation, <laughs> the key to chronic leukemia. And that's how it came out with the children. And those I say could see either what she couldn't see, and the two children picked it out. And the 923 translocation, which is a key determinant of chronic leukemia. But where did this 923 translocation start with? The idea of it. I go back to medical school for me, the University of Pennsylvania. My teacher there was Peter Knoll. Peter Knoll is also one of the heroes in terms of the science. And Peter Knoll, he was the one who first realized there must be a chromosomal problem causing this problem, 923 translocation. But he couldn't see that change yet. He needed Dr. Riley's kids. But Peter Knoll said there is a problem, and we're going to call it a chromosome problem. And he was thinking, and he was so magnanimous that he said, I must name this chromosome problem. And Peter Knoll at the University of Pennsylvania, he called it the Philadelphia chromosome. So the Peter Philadelphia chromosome, Peter Knoll, to Janet Rowley and her two children, to 923 translocation, to complete the circle, coming forward to today, Dr. Brian Drucker. Dr. Drucker is in Oregon. Dr. Drucker discovered a drug that deals and can address 923 translocation and can reverse the genetic defect that's seen in 923 translocation. That drug called Bleevec is now cured cancer. We do not know, we no longer have chronic leukemia. So we have from Dr. Drucker, Dr. Riley, and Dr. And <coughs> Dr. Dr. Peter Nolan. Peter Knoll and Janet Riley won the last year awards, much like the Nobel Prize. Brian Drucker, young man, I'm waiting to see his name out there for the Nobel Prize as well. <laughs> but it's actually about the prepared mind, and I think so much about the prepared mind. One last thing I would like to say about my own ventures with the prepared mind is my goal in my science when I was a, a fellow at the University of Chicago in college oncology, I, I wasn't afraid to dream big. I had worked on with my, with my mentor, we, we, we were going to discover the cure for AIDS. I knew it. We were going to discover the cure for AIDS. We had a small drug we were working with. It was an immune stimulant. It would stimulate the immune system, and there would no longer be AIDS. 1984. 
I knew I had the real deal here. So, we wrote a clinical trial, 24 patients at our clinic, at my clinic. We were not only going to discover a cure for AIDS, we were going to do it right in front of us with our patients. 12 patients we randomized to get the immune stimulant, and 12 patients we randomized to get the placebo. Three or four months later, we realized the real deal we did not have. We did not have the key to AIDS. We thought about it, but we didn't have it. But we did have 24 patients who had been very carefully monitored over a period of months, and they had a lot of lab tests and a lot of lab draws. So I said, well, maybe I don't have to cure for AIDS, but I do have a nice data set. And this is where, again, one has to think about a prepared mind in a sense. I was taking, at that time, business school courses at the University of Chicago, and my business school assignment was to learn statistical regression. And I figured, what better way to learn regression but to use my own data set, rather than the teacher's data set they're going to give me and some data set that I'm not really very too much caring about. So I took my 24 patients. I said, let's forget about this drug now. They're all in the same wavelength. They're all in the same group now. And can I find a lab study a lab factor in these 24 patients that will predict the development of AIDS. And I looked at the data set, used my little statistical package from the business school, and I found that the CD4 lymphocyte count would predict the development of AIDS in my little data set. Big exciting finding. I went to the American Society of Hematology, put it up with the plaster and the paper and the poster board. Very exciting. I made a great discovery. The next thing you do with a great discovery, of course, is to send it to a medical journal, waiting to see your name in lights. Send it to the medical journal, get that rejection letter back. Dear Dr. Bennett, very good idea. Small data set, not good enough for our journal. One year later, Science Magazine comes up with the National Cancer Institute. Big data set, and what do they find is the most important factor for predicting AIDS? The CD4 lymphocyte count. So I always say, take the heart to myself, that I was not afraid to go take the big stride forward. But I did take a chance, and I had a small data set, but one year before the scientific discovery came out, able to publish my work. So what I want to think about in the end of the day is I think about it, two lessons for y'all. The prepared mind. And when I think about the prepared mind, at least what I've learned from my mentors, Dr. Blumberg, Dr. Raleigh, then going forward, is there's two things that are really critical for the prepared mind. And I think Steve addressed them as well. First is the content expertise. You will not, not be able to take a set of uh, uh, ideas if you don't have expertise in your content area. For me as a scientist and for others as a scientist, the content area that we talk about is medicine. I've got a medical degree. Not only is that, I practice medicine, I'm a hematologist, oncologist. I have a strong foundation in the content area, but many physicians, all physicians, have strong content expertise. But what's the second lesson to learn, and I think it has to come together, is the idea of critical thinking. And critical thinking is to take and have the ability to see patterns like the 923 translocation, when it looks like 23 pieces of paper. And that to me came, a lot of that came to me with my PhD work and ran in Santa Monica. So as I leave you today to think about going forward, I'd like to think that we go forward with prepared mind, like Louis Pasteur said. And I'm pleased when the New England Journal of Medicine wrote about our work on the Rift Pelton and on this finding we had overseas, that the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine from the FDA she wrote, Dr. Bennett made an important discovery today, and I think he did his work because he had a prepared mind. That's what I hope to leave you all with today. Thank you.